Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. As always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. We've got your free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Uh, simply an email, we'll get you access to that. So kind of a no-brainer to have. Uh, we also get you updates when we got new podcasts and other episodes available. So uh, go check that out at reallifepharmacology.com. All right, so the drug of the day today is not actually one drug. This is a unique podcast um, by request. Uh, somebody asked me to kind of talk a little bit more in depth about uh, drug interactions. So um, when I was putting this together, I was trying to figure out what, what to do a little bit because uh, obviously there are thousands of drug interactions uh, and I'm not going to cover them all today, of course. Um but I thought a really nice place to start would be mechanisms of drug interactions because, um, you know, one drug interaction is definitely not the same as all other drug interactions. So uh, I wanted to start with some of the most common uh, mechanisms of drug action and then obviously give you some uh, real life examples of these. So uh, without further ado, uh, the first drug interaction is probably one of the more simple ones, uh, and that's binding or absorption kind of blocking interactions. Uh, common examples here, so you've got calcium that can bind up quinolones, uh, quinolone antibiotics like levofloxacin, for example. Um, iron, zinc, uh, they can bind up quinolones as well. Uh, another antibiotic that can often be bound by some of these metal cations, uh, tetracyclines, uh, like doxycycline, tetracycline, uh, that can definitely be, be bound up uh, in the gut and absorption blocked. So what that's going to lead to potentially is treatment failure, where we're not getting adequate concentrations of the drug into the bloodstream uh, to do its effects. So obviously, if we're talking antibiotics, uh, we're looking at treating an infection. And if we don't get concentrations high enough, uh, we could potentially uh, lead to not successfully treating that infection. Uh, another, uh, the other classic binding example I want to talk about is levothyroxine. Uh, so again, many of these uh, supplements like magnesium, calcium, zinc, um, iron can bind to levothyroxine. And again, that leads to lower concentrations. And naturally, people could uh, start to display uh, symptoms of hypothyroidism. Uh, this is one that uh, I talk with students about. Uh, if you've got a patient whose uh, levels are stabilized, their TSH is normal, they're feeling great, or euthyroid, I guess. Um, what, what do you do? And, you know, consistency is the key, in my opinion. If you've got somebody that's stabilized, they're doing well, um, and you maybe notice that they're taking their calcium supplement close to their levothyroxine, or maybe a multivitamin that you're concerned about or something with some iron in it, um, I, consistency is the key. So as long as they're consistent with what they're doing, I'm generally not going to have them change it. Uh, now, if I look back in the record and, you know, doses have escalated over time, you know, maybe we've had three dose increases in the last year or so or six months, uh, that's probably a situation where you better take a good hard look and make sure we're not having any binding interactions. So uh, definitely important uh, to remember that. Uh, one other med that's notorious for binding interactions, uh, causing them and reducing the absorption of many other medications uh, is sucralfate, so that's a GI medication, uh, sometimes used for some dyspepsia and some heartburn type symptoms. Um, so that's definitely a, another good one to remember. That can cause a lot of binding interactions, uh, and we need to pay attention to concentrations of those other medications. All right, moving on. Let's talk about metabolism a little bit. So uh, SIP enzymes, uh, particularly in the liver, um, they are located in other places too, but uh, those liver enzymes um, can cause us some fits at times. So some of the more common ones, um, CYP3A4, CYP2D6, uh, CYP2C19, 
uh, SIP2C9. Uh, there are plenty of others as well. Uh, SIP1A2 is another example. Um, when we have drugs that inhibit these enzymes, it can increase the concentrations of other medications that are broken down by these specific enzymes. So uh, to give you a few examples here, uh, so ciprofloxacin inhibits SIP1A2. And if we use Cipro in combination with tizanidine, uh, tizanidine concentrations can go up due to that Cipro blocking that enzyme. Another example, Cip2C9, uh, fluconazole and metronidazole. Those are two common examples of inhibitors there um, that can significantly uh, increase warfarin concentrations. Uh, CYP2D6, so some of the, quite a few, actually a few of the antidepressants are inhibitors of CYP2D6. Uh, the strongest ones tend to be bupropion, fluoxetine, uh, and peroxetine, or at least the, the strongest ones of the uh, antidepressants that are most commonly used. And um, there's certainly plenty of drugs that are broken down by CYP2D6, so it could raise concentrations there. Uh, but with CYP2D6, we have a couple unique ones uh, where tamoxifen uh, and codeine are prodrugs. So they're actually converted by CYP2D6 into active forms. So when we use bupropion, for example, inhibiting CYP2D6 will actually prevent the conversion to the active form. So drugs like tamoxifen and codeine can actually have their responses reduced, their clinical responses reduced with the use of a CYP2D6 inhibitor. So a little bit confusing, but because they're prodrugs, uh, they're affected in the opposite way. Uh, a few others I uh, wanted to mention, CYP2C19, uh, fluvoxamine or Lu brand name Luvox, uh, has a ton of drug interactions. Be really, really careful with that medication if you see it used for psychiatric purposes. Um, it can uh, inhibit 2C19. And uh, if you remember, uh, clopidogrel is another one of those medications that's a prodrug. Uh, so that conversion uh, can essentially be blunted uh, to the active form. Uh, so that may reduce the clinical effectiveness of um, clopidogrel there. Uh, CYP3A4 is a biggie and an important one. Uh, clarithromycin, grapefruit juice, erythromycin, these are all uh, drugs that inhibit CYP3A4, some of the azole antifungals. Uh, these drugs inhibit CYP3A4, so naturally they're going to increase concentrations of certain medications that are broken down by CYP3A4. Uh, some, of the, some of the statins, uh, particularly simvastatin, is a little higher risk for interacting uh, by CYP3A4 inhibitors, so concentrations could go up there. Uh, and then on the flip side, we've got to remember CYP3A4 inducers, which can lower concentrations of certain medications. Um, so carbamazepine, phenytoin, St. John's wort, these are all enzyme inducers, CYP3A4 enzyme inducers. Uh, they can reduce the concentrations of medications like oral contraceptives, for example. Uh, Warfarin's another example there as well. Um, some of the uh, newer anticoagulants, uh, their concentrations may be uh, reduced as well and their effectiveness reduced too, like a pixaban or rivaroxaban uh, to a certain extent. Uh, so those are definitely important uh, to remember there as well. All right, so that is uh, number two and metabolism. Um, I also want to remind you guys, uh, I've got the Clinician's Guide to Common Drug Interactions in Primary Care. Um, I've got that available as an audiobook, and uh, Audible actually lets you uh, try a book for free. Uh, so if you want to take uh, advantage of that, I've got a link. Uh, if you go to meded101.com slash store uh, and click on the Audible book links, you can actually get your uh, first one for free and uh, try out Audible if you've never done that before. So uh, again, Clinician's Guide to, to Common Drug Interactions in Primary Care. I've also got a paperback uh, and ebook available there if, as well if you'd, if you'd rather read it, but um, certainly that Audible offer is a nice one for some folks. So again, meded101.com slash store, click on the Audible Books tab, and uh, you should see that listed there. 
All right, let's get through these others uh, maybe a little bit more quickly. Uh, so transporters, uh, particularly in the gut. So the most famous one is P-glycoprotein. So P-glycoprotein essentially pumps toxins and sometimes drugs uh, back into the gut lumen. So if we have medications that inhibit that, uh, we're going to potentially increase uh, the concentrations of certain medications. So a uh, classic example is uh, one of the older calcium channel blockers uh, like verapamil. This inhibits P-glycoprotein, um, which ultimately prevents that pumping of certain drugs like apixaban uh, back into the gut. So if we're preventing that pumping back into the gut, we're going to raise concentrations, blood concentrations potentially there. All right, so that's uh, pretty much all I'm going to say on uh, kind of those those transporter type interactions there. Uh, protein binding, I definitely want to mention. Um, so if a drug is highly protein bound, when we use other medications that are also highly protein bound, it can essentially kick medications off of the protein in the blood and allow for a higher free fraction, which is basically um, going to result in more clinical effects. Uh, so an example here, uh, take a drug like phenytoin or valproic acid. Those are highly protein-bound drugs. If you've got a patient taking warfarin, which is also highly protein-bound, um, phenytoin or valproic acid binding to the blood protein will actually kick warfarin off and that'll increase that free fraction of warfarin that's able to go and do its effects uh, and ultimately this is going to lead to a uh, potential raise in INR and an increased uh, bleed risk. So uh, definitely something to, to pay attention to with highly protein bound uh, drugs there. And Phenytoin, uh, valproic acid, uh, and warfarin are, are definitely three uh, kind of classic examples there. Uh, less common uh, drug interaction is excretion drug interaction, so kind of renal action. Um, the gout medication probenicid is kind of notorious with this. Um, it's definitely something I've seen come up on board exams and pharmacology exams, even though in clinical practice, uh, it's been quite some time since I've actually seen probenicid used for the management of gout. Uh, so probenicid, how it causes drug interactions is it blocks the excretion of certain types of uh, medications that are primarily renally eliminated. Uh, and the most common one here is penicillin antibiotics. So essentially what probenicid does is increases the blood concentrations of penicillin antibiotics by reducing uh, that elimination in the kidney there. All right, moving on, we've got additive effects. So these aren't, I guess, in, in my mind, true um, pharmacokinetic drug interactions. They're more of a pharmacodynamic additive effect uh, type drug interactions. Uh, so some common examples here is uh, bleed risk. So you take aspirin, um, you know, with uh, another NSAID for pain, uh, with an anticoagulant. Obviously, that's going to have an additive effect when it comes to bleed risk. So that's really, really important to recognize. Uh, another classic example is uh, sedation or CNS depression. Uh, taking opioids with benzodiazepines, with alcohol. Obviously, these all have kind of cumulative additive effects and could increase the risk that we cause excessive uh, sedation, CNS depressants, uh, depressant type effects. Uh, one more additive one I wanted to mention was uh, certainly anticholinergic burden uh, can be problematic in our geriatric patients. Uh, so diphenhydramine, taking that for sleep, for example, um, adding that on top of uh, oxybutynin, which is also highly anticholinergic, um, can increase kind of the, the risk for additive anticholinergic effects like dry eyes, dry mouth, um, 
confusion, urinary retention, constipation, uh, and things of, of that nature. So uh, definitely remember some of those um, adverse effect profiles. And when we've got you know two, three, four medications that are doing the same thing or having the same side effects, we can run into a lot of those additive effects. Uh, and then on the flip side, uh, we've certainly got opposing effects. Uh, so kind of a, a classic example here is uh, beta blockers used in cardiovascular conditions typically. Uh, so a drug like uh, metoprolol or propranolol, um, that can potentially blunt the action of drugs that we're trying to use uh, or have beta agonist action, such in such as in uh, COPD or asthma, for example. So an albuterol inhaler or a long-acting beta agonist. Um, these can potentially blunt and oppose each other's effects. Uh, another one is uh, dopamine. So cinnamon, we're trying to increase the amount of dopamine to the brain. Uh, if patients are taking an antipsychotic with dopamine blocking activity, we're essentially doing the opposite. And naturally, antipsychotics can worsen symptoms of Parkinson's. And excessive cinnamon dopamine action can... Uh, worsen the symptoms of schizophrenia potentially. So again, recognizing uh, some of, of that interplay and recognizing kind of the opposition nature of certain medications is really, really important. Uh, and then I wanted to mention that there definitely are plenty of kind of food medication interactions. Um, I've, I've got the MedEd 101 Guide to Food Drug Interactions uh, available on Amazon. It's it's a, a book, basically a kind of a reference guide um, that can be helpful for some. Um, but there are many medications that can cause uh, certain deficiencies, um, as well as uh, on the flip side, many kind of supplements and vitamins that can cause uh, drug interactions uh, in you know preventing absorption or increasing absorption as well. I think of vitamin C um, you know, potentially increasing the acidity of the gut, uh, which can actually aid in iron absorption. And then, like I alluded to uh, in the uh, opening with binding interactions, you've got calcium supplements, um, which can, you know, totally bind up some of the antibiotics. Well, same thing happens with food. If you get a large calcium intake uh, with milk, dairy products, uh, that can definitely bind up some of those uh, medications like quinolones, for example, or tetracycline derivatives and ultimately reduce absorption there. So um, tons of, of food, medication, supplement interactions out there. Uh, but I did want to mention that, that specifically and um, remind you of the MedEd 101 Guide to Food Medication Interactions, which has been a pretty popular uh, reference for folks there. Uh, and then summing it up, you know, with all these drug interactions, um, that clinician's guide to common drug interactions in primary care, um, I've got that broken down by disease states. So if you specialize in an area, if you're, you know, healthcare professional that, you know, works in neurology or GI or psych or cardiovascular, um, I've got some of the most common drug interactions that uh, would be good to commit to memory uh, laid out within each of those uh, different categories within the book. So um, definitely don't hesitate to, to take advantage of that. Uh, if you're a pharmacist or other healthcare professional, again, plenty of other resources, case studies, study materials, if you're taking board exams, uh, all those links you can find at meded101.com slash store. Uh, please take advantage of that, support the sponsor. And uh, that definitely helps us uh, keep this podcast going and grow the podcast as well. Uh, if you have any comments, suggestions on uh, future episodes or medications or anything like that, don't hesitate to reach out to me, uh, mededucation101 at gmail.com, or you can track me down on LinkedIn as well, Eric Christensen, PharmD, BCGP, BCPS. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this diversion from the uh, usual way I do the podcast. Hopefully you found it helpful. Uh, picked up a few practice pearls or maybe a few that uh, will help you on your upcoming pharmacology or board exams if you're going down that road. So thanks so much for listening. Uh, take care and I hope you have a great rest of your day.